Good afternoon. What a beautiful day God has given to us that we could come to his house and receive his good gifts. This is the last uh, midweek Advent service of the year. During the Advent, uh, the midweek services, we've been talking, asking the question, who is Jesus? Talked about Jesus being the son of David, Jesus being the son of Abraham, and tonight, Pastor Blumenberg is going to talk about Jesus being the son of Solomon, the great king of Israel who started out uh, with lots of things going right for him. He was a powerful leader. He was uh, the wisest man in the world, the richest man in the world, and yet his wives sent him on a detour, and he lost half his kingdom. And when he finished his reign, he was literally half the king that he had been. But Pastor Blumenberg is going to talk more about that in the sermon today. We're going to follow the order of service of prayer and preaching on page 260. Our opening hymn, hymn 341, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. The Lord's blessings on your worship this afternoon.
Please stand. We begin with the opening versicles on page 260. This is the day which the Lord has made. From the rising of the sun to its setting, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God shall come. He shall not keep silence. Prepare the way of the Lord. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue by singing the fifth verse of hymn 341. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. The Old Testament reading for this, the third midweek of Advent, is taken from the first book of Kings, the 11th chapter. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. He had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines. And his wives turned away his heart, for when Solomon was so old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shamash, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite at this time for the children to come forward for a message just for them. And as they make their way to the front, uh, just a reminder, after our service here this afternoon, uh, please join us for fellowship and for a soup dinner in the fellowship hall after the service, uh, which is sponsored by the youth of our congregation. Also, this upcoming Sunday is our 
annual cantata service, so we invite you all to come to that both at 9 and 11.15. Also, we encourage you all to come and to lift up your voices at our special opportunities to gather and celebrate the birth of the Christ child, both on Monday, Christmas Eve, uh, and Christmas Day on Tuesday. On Christmas Eve, we will have the 7 o'clock service, uh, the Emmanuel Lutheran School Christmas program, and then the 10.30 will be our Christmas candlelight service. And then our Christmas Day festival service will be at 9 o'clock in the morning. Also, we do have some of our door hangers to invite others to worship with us on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So as you leave, uh, please uh, think about picking up a couple extra, or if you haven't picked up any yet, uh, and, and think about those who you might consider uh, inviting to worship with us and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right through here. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon. How are you all doing today? Good. I wanted to turn your attention quick to the Advent wreath up here. And during this season of Advent, we've been making the journey each and every week to Bethlehem to celebrate the birth of the Christ child. Now, I don't know if you remember the first candle. What, do you remember what that candle's called? Hope. Yeah, hope. It's the hope candle. And we talked about the hope that Jesus brings to us because he forgives us of all of our sins. That's right. What about the second candle? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, peace. That's right. We talk about the peace that because of what Jesus brings for us. That's right. And this last Sunday, we lit the third candle. We lit it again here this afternoon. I saw your hand. What, what's the third candle? Yeah, joy. We talked about rejoicing and the joy that Jesus brings to us because he enters the world and comes to be our Savior. That's right. Now tonight, I want to talk to you about the fourth candle, because we won't get a chance to talk about it this upcoming Sunday because of the cantata and all the beautiful music that we'll get to hear. So I want to talk to you about what the fourth candle stands for. Do you, yeah, what, what's the fourth candle? Love. Yeah, love. It's the love candle. That's right. So... I have a couple of things here to share with you this afternoon. What do I have here? Yeah, a bowl, not just a bowl. Yeah, a measuring cup. That's right. What do we use a measuring cup for? Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, you see all those measurements there? It helps you. How many of you are going to be baking cookies here for, because Christmas is right around the corner. How many of you love baking cookies? I, I do. Yep, you, need, you definitely need one of these for the vegetable oil or milk or the flour. Yeah, this, the measuring cup helps you measure how much you need to make cookies or any other kind of food that you might need to make. Now, thinking back to the love candle, does this measuring cup, do you think this could measure God's love? No. 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 That's correct. I don't think it can. Hmm. Because Psalm, Psalm 23 talks about how the love and the goodness of the Lord causes our cups to run over. God gives us so much of his love that it runs over. He blesses us with so much of his goodness. So I don't think a measuring cup can measure God's love. Hmm. All right, let's try something else here. What do I got here? Yeah. Yeah, tape measure. What does a tape measure help us to do? How, what, what does it help us measure? Yeah. Yeah, it helps us measure the length, the width, the height of things. You know, people that are building things like in construction or fixing things around the house, they use a tape measure to help them measure, to help them get the right length and measurement. That's right. Do you think a tape measure can help us measure the love of God? No. No. Are you sure? Hmm. Well, Psalm 108 tells us that God's love is higher than all of the mountains. So, yeah, I don't think a tape measure can help. Let's put that aside. I got something on my wrist. What, what is this? What is this? 
Yeah, a watch. What does a watch help us to measure? Yeah. What's... Yeah, it helps us measure time. That's right. It helps us to know when to be certain places or, or when we need to go. That's right, exactly. Do you think this watch can help us measure the love of God? No. Are you sure? Well, Psalm 103 tells us that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. It, that means it lasts forever. So I don't think a watch can help us measure God's love. Hmm. Do you think there can be anything that measure God's love? I don't know. Well, God's love, it's, from what it sounds like, it's unmeasurable. It's eternal. But there is something that shows us the measure of God's love. Do, do you know how God shows us his love? How does God show us his love? Yeah, well, who? Who died on the cross? Yeah, yeah, Jesus. God shows the measure of his love in Jesus. That's right. You all know the, the gospel in a nutshell, right? The verse from John three sixteen, yeah. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's right. And you said it. He shows it by dying on the cross for us. He shows it by coming to save us. And that's what we celebrate when we talk about God's love, the candle of love. That's how God measures his love to us. That's how we can measure it. Well, we'll light it on, we'll light it on Sunday. But here's the thing. Because like we talked about, Jesus loves so much that he dies on the cross. Because you see, you and I, we don't always love God fully, do we? We don't always listen or, or like his word, kind of like what Solomon did in our Old Testament reading. You know, he at one point followed God's law and his word. He worshiped the Lord God, but he didn't always do that. He kind of departed from God's word and he worshiped other idols and other gods. He sinned, and we don't always fully love God either. But Jesus comes and he finishes what we can't do. And he shows his full love to us when we don't always fully love him. And he does so by dying on the cross and forgiving us of all of our sins. So I want you to remember this upcoming Sunday when we light the fourth candle, the love candle, and each and every day how much God loves you and that he has sent his son Jesus to show that love for you and to die on the cross and rise again from the grave. So thanks be to God for his great and unmeasurable love for us. So let us pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for showing to us your unmeasurable love, that you died on the cross for us and rose again so that we could be forgiven of all of our sins. Help us to love you and your word and to love those around us. And Lord, continue to bless these, your children, and continue to help them to abide always in your word. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up. You can head on back and God's blessings as you continue your journey through the season in Advent. The epistle is from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, the fourth chapter. St. Paul writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you are able, we stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel for this day is taken from the account of St. Matthew, the 12th chapter beginning at the 38th verse. 
Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to the God. We continue now with the responsory for Advent on page 263 in your hymnal. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. We continue our catechetical study by speaking together the Lord's Prayer on page 264. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue now by singing the sermon hymn, hymn 375, Come Your Hearts and Voices Raising, hymn 375. You may be seated.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is from the Gospel of Matthew, especially this verse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, one of my seminary professors was named Martin Charlemagne. It turns out that he had that last name because he was a descendant of the great Charlemagne, emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor Empire in the 800 AD. Now such a royal name and pedigree like that comes with some pretty high expectations. And so also with Jesus. Matthew says he has the great King Solomon as an ancestor. Solomon himself had royal blood, being the tenth of 17 sons of the King David. Solomon grew up in the palace with privilege, and it seems from early on in his life, he was the chosen one. Almost everything he tried succeeded. When his father, King David, died, there were several in the family that might have become his successor, including older brothers, Absalom, Adonijah, Solomon had them and their supporters eliminated. Solomon was anointed king of Israel and already as a very young man. And if ever there was a true boy wonder, he was at the top of the stack. When asked by God what he desired, he asked for wisdom, and he got it. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, wrote more than 1,000 songs. He was a scientist, describing plant life from the cedars of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows from the walls. And he was no slouch politically. He gained control of two main international trading routes that passed near his country. And how about public works that tend to put a king on the map? Well, he negotiated with Hiram, the king of Tyre, a nation filled with cedar trees and wonderful craftsmen. And from that partnership came the Jerusalem temple, the royal palace, and many other public works. And that's not all. He built up the army. He invested in chariots, the mighty battle tanks of the time. He helped Israel reach its economic and political pinnacle, eclipsing even his great father, David. And the results? 1 Kings 4.25 puts it simply. Judah and Israel lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree. In other words, the economy was booming. The standard of living was high. And for the first ten chapters of 1 Kings, Solomon is awesome. But... But then we read in 1 Kings 11, Solomon had 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. A life that started with such great promise went downhill fast. You see, despite his wisdom, Solomon lives foolishly. Though the Lord had blessed him with wisdom for which he prayed, Solomon thought he was too smart to need to follow the Lord. Now, why was that? A couple of years ago, when the mosquitoes were particularly bad in the summer, I got one of those bug zappers to plug in the backyard. And if you sat outside on a summer's evening, you could tell it was working. You would hear these zapping sounds the sounds of bugs hitting a charged grid. Now, if you were a bug, you would know better than to fly into it, wouldn't you? After all, you can plainly see the remains of other bugs who impulsively flew to the light that attracted them and that got permanently grounded from flying. You'd think the warning light would go off. Oh, that won't happen to me. But you know what? Bugs don't pay attention to the warning light, and Solomon didn't either. His wives turned his heart. Although God commanded marriage between one man and one woman, Solomon formed a large harem, 
because he wanted to be like the other kings. Now, I'm sure he rationalized it like this. He figured that these other kings would not attack him if one of their daughters lived in his palace. But these foreign wives brought with them more than an alliance. They brought their own religions. They brought their own idols. They turned Solomon's heart to Ashtoreth and Molech and Chemosh and terrible, terrible idols. Solomon is attracted to the glory and light of being cosmopolitan and inclusive. Zap goes Solomon in all his glory. Zap goes his kingdom. And his people suffer too because the wise one became the fool. Israel is cut in two, a promising start, a shameful end. Temptation is like that, isn't it? It looks so sweet until it gets you. While Matthew goes on to say that Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, it turns out Rehoboam only got to rule half of his father's kingdom. A civil war divided Israel and Judah, and even worse, the idolatry of Solomon poisoned the land. Now, none of us would claim the wisdom, glory, power, and wealth of Solomon, but we may be like him in a way we ought not to be. Like Solomon, we may be great at beginnings. We begin with enthusiasm, tearing into projects and classes and relationships, but that word turns us as well. As time goes on, we get weary and tired and bored. Then we start noticing these other dazzling lights, pride and power and pleasure. We know better, but we fly toward those beckoning lights. And suddenly we find ourselves lying in a tray littered with dead bugs, except instead of bugs, it's dreams and relationships and hopes. And so we need to hear Matthew 12, 42, where Jesus says, One greater than Solomon is here. He meant himself. Jesus, the son of Solomon, is greater than Solomon. Now, when you think about it, Jesus didn't need Solomon or David in his ancestry to be royalty. He is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And yet in coming to us, he came not to a fine palace, but a meager manger in a little town. And still he started magnificently. Kings came from the east to worship him as a little child. At the age of 12, he's teaching the teachers in the temple, and they are astounded at his wisdom. He grows in favor with God and man, we are told. But Jesus is more than a boy wonder. He not only began strong, Jesus finished strong. The political and religious leaders of Israel did not welcome this son of Solomon. They conspired against him. They were scourging and mocking and spitting and beating and crowning with thorns. Still, Jesus finished. In spite of Judas' kiss of betrayal, his friends running for their lives, his countrymen clamoring for his death, in spite of his father forsaking him, Jesus finished. On Calvary, he said it. It is finished. And what happens then? The veil of the curtain in the temple is torn from top to bottom. Sin's curse is removed. The sacrifice is complete. Satan is defeated. Temptation's power is cut. It is finished is no cry of defeat, but a cry of victory for us. And that's why today, we who often have failed to finish a promising start receive better than what we deserve. Not condemnation, but a father's welcome, a shepherd's embrace. Do you have a royal relative in your ancestry? Is there someone famous in history that you're related to? Well, even if there is no Charlemagne or Solomon or Washington in your blood, don't lose heart. Being a son of Solomon or a king is a big deal, but being a child of God is much better. And that is what you are. The king of kings 
came to finish victoriously what we failed to do. He came to make us part of his kingdom, part of God's family. Scripture says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is past, the new has come. And that brings this good news to us who wait for our king's return. Since we are surrounded, Hebrews says, by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. However much life is left for us, we are to finish strong. Finishing strong doesn't mean finishing easily. It doesn't mean finishing without blood, sweat, and tears. Finishing strong simply means fixing our eyes daily on the world's only true light, Jesus, the Son, the one greater than Solomon. The beckoning lights of sin and temptation try to distract us and take us off course. But Jesus, the one so much greater than Solomon, promises, He who has begun a good work in you will finish it on the day of Christ Jesus. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Savior unto life everlasting. Amen. We worship the Lord now with the gathering of our tithes and offerings and encourage you to register your attendance. You may be seated. As our offerings are brought forward, please stand for prayer. O God, true peace can only be found in you. And though we have often walked in the darkness of sin, you have sought us with the light of Christ. Cease all of our sad divisions and bring peace to every nation of the world. 
and bless our offerings and our lives of service that we may bring the light of Christ to others in this dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We join in the responsive prayer of the church on page 265. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we join in praying together the evening prayer on page 266. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Please join us for the meal and also the adventures table for the uh, children. Also, after the closing hymn, please greet your fellow worshipers tonight and introduce yourself to those that you may not know around you. And come and join us for the services this weekend and also next week. We now join together to sing our closing hymn, What Child Is This? Hymn 370. God's blessings on the rest of your week. <laughs>